Welcome to For the Record, an unfiltered view on current trends and timeless advice for surviving in the aesthetics industry. Whether you're an injector, practice owner, sales rep, or marketer, it's time to set the record straight. Each week we cut through the chaos and showcase diverse perspectives and winning ideas from the best minds in the industry. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Hall, Chief Growth Officer at Aesthetic Record. Now, let's get started on this week's episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of For The Record. And today we have a California girl with us, um, a dear friend of mine who has been really on stage in your face all the places lately, including opening a new location. She is a speaker for Prolinium. She is a CEO and founder of the Stepanian Clinic in LA and a new one now in Thousand Oaks area, Encino area. She's also traversing, like I said, the US, speaking on behalf of Prolinium, doing a lot of local events. You might see her on stage somewhere. And she's also just the real deal Lucille. So she just says it like it is and is very authentic and has kind of called out the bullshit on a lot of things in the industry that are happening right now with KOLs and just doing whatever's in vogue to get things done. So I'm thrilled today to welcome a dear friend of mine whose name I'm learning right now that I've been saying wrong for the past two years, Nune Stepanian. Welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. The first thing I want to say is if you are easily triggered or offended, please stop watching right now, right now. Turn it off. Yeah, because I obviously, um, the name I, you know, got there, but the Stepanian Clinic is like, TSC is like a big deal. People know it. It's everywhere. You're growing and thriving. And I think, I, I just love your story. I heard you speak at Prolinium at the Women's Conference. I don't know how long, was it two months ago, three months ago? And March, I just loved yeah. what I loved what you said. You were just like, this is me. I'm who I am. I do what I do. And if I'm good for you, then great. And if I'm not, that's okay, too. Like, you know, my, my tribe is who I want. And if you're not in it, then, you know, so be it. You're not like falling at people's feet, begging for business. You're not trying to change who you are to get clients in the door. Like you just know your moral compass and you kind of stick with it. And I love that about you. So give our audience an idea. Since 2016, you've been in the industry, kind of what's happened and transpired to get you to this point right now? Um, the Mean Girl vibe has never been mean. Uh, I, when I first started in the industry, I felt it very heavily because I just didn't look the part. My name was very strange for people. <laughs> uh, you didn't have KOLs that looked like me. You didn't have KOLs that talked like me. It was just a very strange place to be for me. Obviously, I had just had my child. I was obese. I <laughs> didn't look the part. So I would get that. What are you doing here? And an actual, like... I was actually told you can't sit here. I was at a conference and I walked up and it was an empty seat and you can't sit with us is a thing. And it happened to me with adults. So I always held on to that. Not in a, not in a, oh my God, I'm a show them kind of way. Just, I don't need to be in that seat. If I'm not wanted there, I will create my own seat kind of thing. You know, that whole, that one meme that was going viral saying like, if all the doors close on you, go back and buy the building. That's kind of the vibe. <laughs> um, but since 2016, yeah, I kind of just grew out of a primary care clinic, a phlebotomy room, uh, doing injections on pretty much all of my family members so that, you know, I wouldn't get sued. <laughs> so I could learn practice. Um, but I never did anything cavalier. So a lot of people I see, like they get, they start and they, they, they jump into like complicated procedures. They want to do everything. I was doing five point injections. I was doing five points here, five points here, three and three. I was like, done. That's me. This is it. I'm, I'm the greatest injector of all time. So I, but because I trusted myself to do that because worst case scenario, what am I getting like that? absolute worst case scenario. I'm going to end up with a droop. I had a doctor next to me. Like it was just a safe place for me to be. And with safety in mind, I grew the practice from there. Like I wouldn't stop just because I wasn't welcome at certain places. I, I kept going. I, I put my name out there. Um, I always thought that I was going to be some sort of celebrity, like a dancer, um, <laughs> never made it there. <laughs> uh, singer. I'm not that good at that either. Uh, but like, I always wanted that being on stage, entertaining. I love the entertainment industry kind of thing, but I would never like sell my soul to succeed in that industry. Uh, so with TikTok and Instagram and social media there, it's like you, you are your own celebrity on that point. Like you get to create your own celebrity status on there. 
whether you have one view or 10 views or 100 views, that's 100 people that are watching you. It sounds ridiculous. Like, oh, it's only 100 views, but that's 100. Like you have an audience of 100. So that's still a huge deal. So if you can imagine yourself speaking in front of 100 people, speak 1,000 views, speaking in front of 1,000 people, that's you're creating and you're developing. And with that in mind, I never cared. Like I did a belly dancing video and I had ta- uh, taped all of these products, fillers, toxins all around my hips. <laughs> I did it. it was a trend. That song was a trend. So I did a whole hip dancing thrusting video that went viral, like hundreds of thousands of views. And sure, people would have been like, oh, my God, this is so unprofessional or she cusses or this or that. But if that offends you, then don't come to me. So it, it was never like a uh, I'm going to be on this platform and please everybody kind of thing. It was this is me, <laughs> take it or leave it. Um, and then I was an educator for the university. So I had a lot of students who looked up to that aspect of it. Sure, it's not your traditional learning experience, but um, with the alumni association, I was making content for the university and I had the students involved as well. But things like that just blew up because that's where I feel like I was shining. Um, and I brought that into the aesthetic world with me. So And I didn't give up. If something wasn't doing well, if something flopped, I was like, I didn't delete it and move on. I was like, all right, whatever, let that stay. It's just, it's there. It doesn't need to go anywhere. It's not a failure. I created it. I had fun with it. It wasn't a waste of time. So social media has been a very big aspect. (laughs) Um, And then I had to bring on a team, obviously, because that is like a full-time job. (laughs) <laughs> I watched well I watched you at the aesthetic show making one reel and it was like art I mean you had everyone doing all these different parts and pieces and I was like I don't have the energy for that shit <laughs> I mean I watched you and I thought I don't know how she does it because I'm just not at the level that you're at and I mean you make some masterpieces you make some legit masterpiece pieces for con- of, of content that I think probably are better than an agency who does it full time like you're probably better I'm sure I know you're better than many agencies who do this full time and like, that's a skill, sister. That is a big skill that I certainly don't have. I have to use all these editing softwares and video things. And you're just like on Instagram, just flitting through there, making it look amazing. So kudos to you for your skill set. Thank you. I love it. But I think People like that, that, that aspect of this industry, but I love it. I mean, I hate that I have to set time aside to do the content, but it comes naturally to me because I am the generation that grew up with uh, phones in our hands and uh MySpace, Facebook, like everything just got posted, posted, posted. I mean, I thank God that there was a period that I I didn't experience that because <laughs> I still know that, that I have that taste <laughs> of not everything gets shared online. Thank God for that. Um, but then again, at, at towards the end of high school, college, I just, I feel like my generation, anybody, millennials, like we don't have excuses to not be good at this stuff. We freaking grew up with it. Like we were coding on MySpace without knowing that we were coding. Um, and then Facebook came around and we're dropping albums on there. Like it's the same concept. It just, as it changes, we change with it. And if, if you don't, then you're not going to excel in that area. And the, and this industry is so heavy in that area. Yeah, but yeah, I think people often forget, though, that you're also a doctor of nursing practice. Like, you have a doctorate. You're a nurse practitioner. Like, you're a legitimate clinician also. And I think people often, you know, we hate on social media all the time. You know, guests on the show, even myself, I hate on it sometimes about it's so overwhelming. And people get really caught up in the social media and how cool it looks. And you know, let's say that you are an amazing Instagram um, creator, which you are, and you are like a shit clinician. That's a concern for me, right? You have to be equally matched, have great clinical skills, and also great skills with all the creation to build your business. Luckily for you, you have both, but lots of folks don't have both. So how do you balance that to spend as much time on you as an injector and your clinic and your team getting great at the clinical side of things while also still staying abreast of all the cool trends and audios and TikTok reels and things that you have to do to be able to keep your doors open and and drive patients in the front door? Because I don't think of it like that. I don't think of it as like it's another aspect for for me to implement. I think they go hand in hand. And I, I learned that from the very beginning. So if I was doing a before and after, it was being recorded. We we're taking those pictures anyway. We need to document, we need to we upload it to aesthetic record. Like we are doing that stuff anyway. The added step is to hit post. 
So it it was it's just implemented into the practice. So anybody who's signing on who works at TSC, they know that they have certain posts to make a week. They have certain content they need to provide and create because that's part of the job. And when I say that you're you're doing the before and afters anyway and posting, you're still learning as you go, regardless of what you're doing. So if I'm going to a conference and you saw that was a learning experience, I went to all of the classes, I watched all the injectors, I went through um, what is it the convention hall uh i signed up for a new credit card that was interesting but anyway uh (laughs) going through all of that i have my phone in my hand like i'm still learning my priority is to learn always regardless of what uh is happening around me so clinically speaking i've always been a anatomy physiology nerd so like my background is in microbiology science has been a big part of my life um and then obviously i wanted a terminal degree so and for the doctorate degree uh and i always taught like ever since i was a teen i did tutoring it was it's teaching is a very big part of my uh career because i know a lot of people are like oh those who can't do teach but no i do and i teach and i teach because i can do <laughs> so um when people want to like learn and get to that level i didn't it didn't just happen i literally worked my behind off to learn all those techniques and then teach all those techniques and then post on those techniques. Um, But to answer your question about like, how, how am I managing? How do I stay on top of the clinical standpoint? I'm always learning. I'm in classes. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm, I uh, train and I have these uh, mentorships and all of that stuff, but I'm, I still go to class. Like I have, I've, uh, what do I have? I have like Four conferences coming up where I'm not even speaking. I'm I'm there because I want to learn. And people will ask me, like, you're at this point where you're teaching and you're still going to classes. Of course, I'm still going to classes because this is so new. This industry is so freaking new. Like, what do we have? The oldest history with Botox is 20 years. Like, that's not enough. 20 years is not enough uh, research to show us like what we can do. Like, we're doing so many crazy things with the lower third of the face now, right? Um you don't just learn that because it's a new it's 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 been around forever we're practicing we're noticing things are changing we're evolving so if you can't stay on top of that then stagnancy is going to kill you well and you have a, you have a staff also right you've got Sean, Sean's at one of your locations right yes, he's yes. an nurse practitioner and you have other injectors i'm sure or people who are just staff i think part of learning is as they're also learning, going with them. Because when you come back to the clinic and you're now, they're now sort of in your care, right, to be their their medical or clinical director, knowing whatever they've heard at a conference, how they've learned is important, I think, for you to either correct behavior, learn from there, jump off to you know, a more advanced component. Like I think if you send your whole team to a conference and you never go, to me, that's just really disappointing as an as an owner. Like if I if my team goes somewhere to learn, I want to go with them so that I know what their frame of reference is today. Because when they come back in and start doing all these crazy things, I'm be like, where the hell did you hear that from? Oh, wait, I was there beside you at the conference and I heard it. I heard what you heard. Now I'm going to take whatever I just learned and kind of make it work in our environment or our atmosphere. And I think if you don't do that, your people come back with all kinds of wild ideas and you, you're you like, you're the guy out in the cold. You don't know anything that's going on. And I don't want to, I mean, I, they're looking for me for leadership. I don't want to be the one that's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Tell me more. It just doesn't, it's just not a good look for me. So I think you ought to, I think you should go learn all the time. Like I would learn every day all the time. I listen to audiobooks the same way every day all the time to learn about all kinds of things in business because it's always evolving. I mean, you're, if you ever know everything, you're in an industry that's dying. And we know we are definitely not dying here. We are constantly evolving and growing. So you got to stay, you got to keep, you got to, David Goggins, it. you got to keep pushing. I'm reading his book right now. You got to keep pushing and find, you know, it's never finished. That's what he says. And I agree with that. Well, with me, it's lead by example. So if I'm not doing something and I expect them to be doing it, why should they do it? These are adults. They're not children. <laughs> like they, they're they already set in their ways. So if they see you doing a certain standard and ho- upholding a certain standard, then they know that that's the, mi- that's the minimum of what they have to do because you have to go above and beyond. I go above and beyond for everyone and everything. Um, um, Sean joining my practice, he is now opening his own, or he has already opened it, um, his own med spa in Banning. And I have my, another nurse who's opening her own med spa. Like I don't, a lot of people can turn around and be like, well, isn't that really dumb of you to do? Teach them all your proprietary methods and train them, mentor them. And they go and they open up shop. No, I'm not threatened by that. That that's not something that I think we should be threatened by. I, 
encouraged that. I housed it. I created safe providers. And now they get to implement that into places that I'm not at, you know? So the whole point is we're doing this. So other people, two other people, a lot of people forget this is patient care. I do come from a background of emergency medicine. So I have that bedside manner that I want you, I want to take you from here to here. I want to see you evolve. Just the other day I was, I saw a patient who, um, I met her and her boyfriend when they were boyfriend and girlfriend. I was there for the engagement. I was there for the wedding when she had her first baby, when she had her second baby. And I've seen that whole lifespan. I've seen the children. I've seen their love grow. I've seen like, I get so much joy out of that because Yes, this is a business. Yes, we are for profit. But if money is the number one reason why you are doing something, you are asking for disasters. And I don't, I don't operate that way. I mean, maybe I'm a dumb <laughs> businesswoman, uh, but I mean, don't get me wrong. I love money. Who doesn't love money? But it, at the end of the day, when I see that I have the, my population just keeps getting younger and younger. And it like, it hurts me because I also have a daughter and I don't want her to think at the age of 16 that lip filler is the first thing we need to do. Like when I was growing up, uh, rhinoplasties were the thing. And I'm also, we're also, I'm also Armenian. So <laughs> we got some hungers. So if you're <laughs> in high school, you're getting your nose done. It's like your sweet 16 gift. So that's like normalized. That was normalized back then. But I feel like now the lip fillers are the normalized version of those rhinos that my friends were getting when we were 16, but it's not the same concept. Like the, the if you got a, you know, schnoz right there, it's a little different. There's breathing difficulties. There's like, I feel, I feel like that's a lot more accepted than a 16 year old wanting lips because what do lips do for you? They make you sexier. They it's, it's all about that confidence and that sex appeal. For me, it goes back to like, what will I think? What, how will I react if my daughter wants that, like to be sexy at 16? It's, it's, it, I, that's how I implement into practice too. Like I, I, when I see these kids, well, what about parental consent? And I won't do it. Um, but it, back to being a not so smart businesswoman, <laughs> money is not my number one priority. I, I'm not going to be making the change. I'm not going to be like mother Teresa over here of the aesthetic industry, but if I say no and I take the time to educate as to why you should wait because you're still freaking developing, um, then maybe I can affect one person and that's more than enough for me. Well, I think it's like, I mean, there's an emotional component to that too. And they also, they don't stay, right? They're 16. Then they grow up, they graduate, they go to different colleges, they move away. Like it's, it's not like you're turning down a patient who's going to be this long-term amazing um, big lifetime value patient for the practice. Like I think these young, even young people who are doing like estheticians, it's, it's turn and burn because they, you know, it's money today, money tomorrow. They're here, they're there, they're everywhere. I mean, it's not, to me, I think that's a very smart decision. And also because to your point, they're very young and, you know, it's just ethically it might be a dilemma for many people. For me, it would be a bit of an ethical dilemma. Um, I also had rhinoplasty and I'm not Armenian, but that was a huge, that was a life-changing thing, but I waited until I was 22 years old to do it, right? I wanted to make sure I was like grown and could make the decision on my own before I did it. But you mentioned in the beginning about mean girls and like being Armenian, not looking like you're, you know, like everybody else, which is so crazy because the Kardashians are all Armenian. Like if you go to LA, everyone who's beautiful in LA is an Armenian person. I mean, <laughs> it's, it shocks me in the aesthetic industry that you were looked at as being someone sort of on the fringe or different because all the people who we want to look like are, are Armenian, by the way. But you mentioned the mean girl thing. And I'd, I've heard this now twice in about a month. Um, I don't know if you know Dr. Lana, who's in New York. She had the same experience where she was like basically told at the aesthetic show a few years ago, you can't, you know, can't hang out with us. And it like really changed her perspective on the industry and how she interacts with people and going to conferences. And it happened to you as well. Like this shocks me to hear this because I have never had that experience myself. Maybe because I just don't give a shit. And I'm just like, eh, whatever, who cares? And I, it doesn't, I don't think about it. But like, what do you do as a person in the industry to, like, f combat that? Because you are very, very friendly. You talk to everyone that you meet, and you're always, like, shaking hands and kissing babies. Like, how have you kind of taken on that? I think you've kind of taken on the burden to be, like, you know, the everyman to people and be, like, nice and comforting and welcoming and inclusive because you didn't have that experience. So I'm just so curious of, like, what that did for you. Like, when you walked away from that, that moment, like, how did you go change or rethink your own perspective based on the mean girl situation? Well, you don't know my father. <laughs> That's not, it was, it's, I, I have, okay, I took that, I internalized it and I grew from it, but it, I have a very 
I don't give a, a bleep attitude. So if somebody is not accepting of me, then I don't try to become accepted. It, it's it's that's never been a concept in my mind to try to conform. People butcher my name and I will never give them call me Nikki. Like, no, that, like this is who I am. You will learn my name. <laughs> so it, it's just I, I don't internalize that in the way of like, I shouldn't be here. I turn it into I'm going to pave the way for me and the others like me who do belong here because they want to be here and they excel at this. Well, yeah, shut up the haters. I mean, uh, you know, cue Simone Biles in the comment section of her um, post lately. <laughs> it's yeah. currently the Olympics time, obviously, as we know, it, and I am obsessed with the fact that she was like shutting them all down. But I think mm -hmm. it also speaks to your patient population because I think people – I hear this a lot, you know, I want to have all the patients come into my practice. Like, I just want patients in the front door. Like, but are they the right ones for you? Like, based on your attitude, your perspective, your ideal of beauty, are they the people that you want to actually come in your practice? Because if they're not, and you put a lot of energy forward to try to get them in the practice, the ROI on that's not very good, right? Because you, you've done all the work, you you know, put the money down, and it's like, wait, they're not they're not my people. They're not my tribe. I think you probably attract people who are like, who are like you, who just are like, I am who I am. I'm authentic. I'm out there. I'm doing my thing. Has that changed your practice? Like, because you're very upfront on social media about what you what you expect and how you operate your business. Is that all putting to people? Do you feel like it, it gets you the right folks in the front door? How does that kind of come, you know, um, percolate throughout your business? Absolutely. It puts it puts the right people in my clinic. Like, I, I, I get scared when people come from other places, not from social media. So if they're, if obviously if they're a referral, they've they know people we know like I feel more comfortable but when they just like it I was looking online I googled it you have five stars and here I am and I get scared because I'm like okay now I have to tell you what I can and cannot do like it, it's it sucks because everybody that comes in from Instagram and social media sees what I can and what I cannot do so I if somebody comes in and they're expecting facelift and I'm, I have to sit there and break their hearts it's like they're not prepared for that conversation. And then I, I might come across as super aggressive for saying you need a facelift. Like I was helping out um, a clinic in Santa Barbara and most of these women, like 90% of these women needed facelifts, like the surgical intervention um, and ha having that conversation with them, like with them not knowing me, I, someone actually said, well, you don't have to say it so aggressively. And one, I'm Armenian again, <laughs> this is my baseline. Uh, and two, it's not that it's aggressive. It's just no one has had that conversation with you. And you weren't adequately prepared because you didn't see me talking about this a hundred times that fillers are not going to give you facelift results, or it's just that expectation. So when people come in already knowing what to expect, it kind of takes the edge off both of us. So with you saying like, you've created this tribe, you've created this culture. Yes, I have. And that makes everyone satisfied. Like it, it takes that um, unknown out of the picture. And then if they do have questions, they'll come in with their little notes in their iPhones and go, we'll go over that one by one. Cause that's what I did. That's what I do whenever I go somewhere. And that's why I put it in my notes so that I, all my questions are answered and they feel comfortable doing that with me. And that's what I want. All of my nurses, all of the staff, that's how they are also doing. Our consultations are half an hour. So there's surgical consultations aren't even half an hour, but mine are. So I want to put everything out there and give them the knowledge and power to make the educated choices that they're not going to be disappointed with. So um, I do want everybody who's walking in through those doors to be comfortable with whatever they're doing, because are we like not having an economic crisis right now? Like didn't the stock market crash today? So to every, everyone who's coming in is like, spending their hard earned dollars like people are working for that money right now so i just feel this responsibility to do to do for them what i would want somebody to do for me and my family members like if i'm gonna go in and um i don't want to am i allowed to say this <laughs> um i don't know I, say it and we'll see <laughs> <laughs> like i i did cool sculpting um on my arms and the provider was telling me that um, you're just going to end up with even worse <laughs> skin laxity because this is not the right option for you. Um, so, and, and I didn't believe her because I just, I don't know. She didn't build that rapport. She didn't build that like, trust or whatever. So it was just like, don't do it. Just don't do it. 
but tell me why, you know, all you said is it, the fat will melt and the skin will hang, but, but tell me why that would happen to me when uh, you guys have all these promotional before and afters and people's arms are worse than mine. And now like, why did they get such a good result? You know, like explain that to me, but that wasn't done for me. So I was like, I want to, I'm going to do it anyway. Anyway, like four grand later, um, <laughs> it did end up being worse and I had to get a brachioplasty. But anyway, like <laughs> I, I, I would have loved for someone to take that time away and educate me, uh, on why that wasn't the best option for me. Or say in that moment, go ahead and have surgery. Like, don't waste your money on this intermediate step because it isn't going to give you what you want. Just go have surgery. Mm -hmm. Like, I appreciate someone saying, I would love to do what you want me to do, but it is just not an option, sister. Skip this little, you know, this like five and, and dime thing we're doing right now, all this money you're spending on this thing to fix it that you cannot fix and go have surgery. Because at the end of the day, recovery from that and the money you spend on that is probably going to come out less anyway than mm -hmm. doing procedures after procedure and nothing ever comes of it. But I know that you lost like a ton of weight at one point. Like, you went from... Um, post baby, you know, a little heavier to like losing a truckload of weight. So you've been through kind of all these different things where you've heard, I'm sure everything under the sun about what, what to fix, how to fix it. And at the end of the day, like people, to your point, they're spending a lot of money here. Like you wanted to hear the truth back then. I want to hear the truth now. They want to hear the truth. It's like, don't give me lip service. I don't want to hear all the things I could do because I deal with the other end of it. And as you know, what they are all the disputes, people who want refunds, people who are mad. So whenever they come in, they dispute the credit card charge of like, well, she said it was going to work and it didn't work. And then you create for yourself a whole other host of problems that would have been way easier to just be like, you know what? I can't do what you want. Like go to the surgeon, have a great referral. Here's his name. When you get that done, come back here and I'll help you with your maintenance. I think sometimes just saying no is the easiest way to go. And the money, you will lose money in the long run if you say yes to things you shouldn't do. Inevitably, you will lose regardless because karma is a bitch and she'll come back for you. And you just got to do things ethically. I just, I believe that. I know that you're very big on saying no. That is a kind of one of your things of like, if I can't do it, I won't say yes. And I'm sure that if you ever change that, you'll get burned. You'll go back, you'll go back to saying no again because everyone always does. <laughs> but it's not like I'm saying no because it's not in my skill set. Like right. I want, I want that to be like a lot of people will be like, oh, they're just saying that because they can't achieve it. But it's not that I can't achieve it. I, it's not achievable in this setting. Like I wish I was a plastic surgeon. I wish I could give you a bluff, but Botox is not going to lift your eyelids like that and if it does you're gonna spock and you're gonna look crazy so it's it's like the that whole re-education of it's not it's not me it's you no <laughs> it's not it's just not gonna be fruitful for anybody like you're you're in it for a disappointment so f me missing out on that whatever a couple thousand dollars here is is going to develop that trust for when they do go to that surgical consult, they get those amazing surgical results. They will come back to me for everything that I can do non-surgically and send their moms, their sisters, their brothers, their entire generation. So that's, that's kind of what I've built the practice on too. It's referral. I haven't, you know, I haven't spent a single dollar on marketing ever, <laughs> ever, that's... not a dollar. Instagram ads, never had one. Well, I cannot say the same here because I have conference <laughs> tickets to sell. But you mentioned the word rapport, and I really believe. So I love the skill set idea too. Because here's here, picture this. You know, you're in a practice, you're in a room, and someone says no. What you just said, they're like, nope, can't do it. If I have not built rapport with you, and I don't trust you, I'm going to think it's because you can't do it. Like, well, I mean, I bet the girl down the street can do it. She probably has more skills than you have. I mean, immediately, if you're a person who really wants it so bad, you're like I want this thing so bad, and then someone tells you no, without the trust authority expertise behind it you're like huh she must not have had enough schooling she doesn't have enough classes she doesn't know what she's doing i'm gonna go somewhere else but if you're like listen i am a wizard i know all the things i have been all the places i am the best you're gonna find and i'm telling you it is not possible it cannot happen the only option you have a surgery and here's why then it's different i think they walk away thinking man you thought about what i needed had my best interest at heart you were concerned about my needs my financial needs my emotional needs not, you must not be very good. And that's why you said no. I think it's all in the delivery. You know, it's all in the like yeah. consultation and delivery. And people who don't, who don't nail that, I think their patients walk away thinking to themselves that they just can't do the job. I think you have to spend time on how to say no in a way that is authoritative and expert without coming across as A, an asshole, but also B, like you don't know what you're doing. Because I think there's a fine line there that can be easy to cross if you're not sure how to do it. I have no doubt that you have authority in the room. I have zero doubt that you, that you that you're the one in charge of the treatment room. <laughs> <laughs> if you I always try to empower my nurses and whoever I'm training 
I want them to automatically, if they even have a shadow of a doubt that they cannot accomplish something, to say no. Like, I actually got in trouble one time for empowering nurses to, not in trouble, but they were upset that I told the staff, learn to say no. Because they come back and now you're dissolving and dissolving and dissolving. And it's just, you created this culture of you made a mistake and now you're fixing it. It's, that's not how it works. Like if I have, I've, again, I've had people following me for eight years, eight years of loyal clientele. So I have seen their lips expand to the point of there's no room. I've had to dissolve. And now that tissue is super lax and now they're freaking out and we have to get them back to a normal size. But that normal size is not their norm because they're so used to the 10 years ago, that look that, you know, we were creating nonstop left and right because of our beloved Kylie Jenner. So I, I like, it's that, that re-education concept of you want me to stretch out that lip. I'm going to stretch out that lip. You're going to get filler up, down and everywhere. And then when you're ready to dissolve, you are going to have lip dysmorphia because you were so used to looking a certain way for 10 years. And now I'm taking that away from you. And when I refill you back up, your tissue is going to be so loose. You're going to take up so much more filler to get you back to a healthy point and then you're going to go want to go beyond that because now you're not used to how you look with regular lips and i think less is more right now i mean the big cheeks remember the days we had even when i was first in aesthetics we had these giant cheeks that would dissolve my whole face basically we had giant cheeks we had giant lips everything was just so big and i do feel like over the past you know really probably since covid frankly i think covid kind of gave us all this like wellness mindset people have really backed away from that i think we're seeing you know this year for aesthetic next i had i don't know 10 people, maybe more, submit abstracts about how to run a days and like deleting, editing, resculpting the face of how to run a days. Like we were talking about this, our, our CEO here is kind of an innovator, wild card kind of guy. He was doing this, you know, 10 years ago, like, oh, he uses how to run a days, like it's a filler. I mean, he's always editing and chiseling the face of how to run a days all the time. And we did it last year at the conference. People were like, holy cow, their minds are blown. I mean, like, haven't we all been doing that? Because we've all had these like crazy ass giant cheeks we had to get rid of for years. And someone has someone has to do the dirty work. But I think now it's become very hip and in vogue because of what you said. People have overfilled for so long. They've been told yes, despite it looking like they've got a big shelf on their cheek for so long that now it's like, wow, I'm like Marge Simpson looking like a hot mess. I got to get back to baseline. And that's going to take... It's not comfortable. Those of you who've not done it yet, how long a day it sucks. It burns like a mother, but it's painful. You got to do a lot of it, and it sometimes depending on the product, it does or doesn't work very well. It's just the whole. It's a whole thing. It's a whole mess. Like just don't do it to start with. I think now if you're coming into the aesthetic industry and you're new as a nurse, you're learning that now, right? You you learn not to do the shelf cheek, but ten years ago you didn't learn that. It was like everyone did it. It was a big thing. You had these giant chins and giant cheeks and giant <laughs> lips. It was like, what were we thinking back then? I have no idea, but thank God we've learned from that from our mistakes. Oh, that's the was the yes. inspo <laughs> she was our yes she was our inspiration thank god now she's not but even <laughs> even the college you mentioned her i mean they had giant lips so, i mean they've even reduced their face sizes because we all looked like we were overly like you know like we had too many salty foods they're all swollen everywhere it just wasn't the look that you wanted but i think it also takes an injector um confidence and a bit of a risk nature to be able to say no in the beginning because they're nervous about having patients they're like i don't want to say no because i got to get the bills paid i have to keep the lights on and I think that's a bad precedent to set because you can't you can't step that back after so long. You kind of kind of live with that for a while. But when did you grow the the cojones to be able to say nope, not doing it? Like, what was your was there like a factor in your life that you're like, you know what, I'm done with this. I've had a bad experience, and I'm going to start saying no, whenever it's the right time to say no. I think because I wouldn't do anything like I said, risky, cavalier, and just something that I wasn't comfortable doing. It, for like straight off the bat, I was comfortable saying no. Like I've turned, I turned people away from the very beginning um, when I would look at their lips and think like, how am I going to make this better? Like it, it's the whole purpose of this field is to make it better. So when you see, like I had this, she looked like a fish. She had like a little hole in here and a little, and she still comes to me, by the way. She's again, one of those people, boyfriend, marriage, first baby, second baby kind of thing. She, she's one of them. And I would look at her and I would be like, I'm not touching you. And it, it was like a very very disappointed, disheartened kind of thing for them. But look, she comes, her mom comes, her husband comes. Like it's just right off the get-go, be, me being that way and having that background. And every time I say this, people think I'm like being condescending or anything, but seriously having some sort of psych background, knowing how to talk to patients. Um, when I was in ED and 
had that experience with um, our mental health patients, it helps me to be able to speak the way I speak. Like, even if it comes off aggressive, even if it comes off too real or too raw or whatever, it, it doesn't hurt me because I know that at the end of the day, this is the way that we need to be speaking to patients. They're, I hate to say this, but it's, they will become friends, but right off the bat, they're not your friends. Um, they're not like, somebody who's going to understand you like this, unless they've done the research on you, they know who, what to expect and all of that stuff. You need to build that trust from the get-go. So if they see you turning away money, then automatically they're going to be like, okay, well, I guess she knows what she's talking about. Um, versus you just being like, I don't think I can achieve that or speaking I'm not saying yell at them, but <laughs> very soft spoken and just you you're not giving them the idea that you know what you're doing so the um I don't know like that that whole aspect it, it needs to go like you got to go in there confidently you got to you know you're the expert so when I do these trainings and when I have practices that will hire me to go in there and mentor their staff and all that stuff I my number one goal is to get them to be able to speak properly to patients because we've, yeah, we call them clients now. Okay. There's that shift already where, where did we lose the patients? Like the, they're still patients, but again, I'm coming from a critical care background. So it's, it's like, to me, they're always patients. Um, Dr. Um, Doan, do you remember her? Mm -hmm. Yes. Dr. Don't, that was her name. Yeah. Um, she, she was up there talking about how we've turned this into like we're beauticians kind of thing. And I, that resonates with me heavily because one, people will come and bargain. I, I, I'm not seeing that a lot of that anymore, but that was, that was a trend that happened. <laughs> that was something that people were doing. Um, and two, your, they come in and say, I want this style. This is not hair. This is not makeup. There's why are, why are we styling people's faces? Like, it's not that whole concept that was being pushed on us. I'm trying to move away from that. I'm trying to say, Hey, try to use the right words. Like there is a volume deficit here. There is, it, it's not like you're going to be able to lift these structures back up with freaking sugar jelly. So having that conversation and moving that, that narrative forward of you're the patient, I'm the provider. I went to school for this. I've been studying my ass off for this. I've been doing this for many, many years will help down the line with them trusting you, with bringing people in, with becoming an industry leader. You're you're building that trust because you know what you're able to do and you got to say it confidently. Yeah, I, you know, I work in tech and tech is like really hard to understand for people. They don't understand all the things that we say here. And I always lead with the thing that I always say, try to say it right, the, the right way first. Like, here's the thing that we do, whatever the technical words are that we're using, just like you guys would for medical. And if they don't get it, I'm happy to use metaphors and anecdotes and all kinds of fun things to help relay it. But I want you to know that I know what I'm talking about in the beginning. Like, I'm not just making shit up as I go. Like, this is how this thing works. If that doesn't resonate with you, let me give you some examples of what that might look like in everyday life or how you might, you know, how they can understand what you're saying. But I think if you lead with like the fun vernacular that's like very... Um, you know, casual and, and you know, kind of urban dictionary kind of thing, it, you lose credibility. Like they want you to, to talk like their doctor talks to them. And if you go to the medical center, you know, to the ER or to the, you know, cardiologist, he doesn't say things like, so your heart, you know, it's uh, here's what's happened with it. And they give you like clinical data, clinical information. And I think we've gotten away from that because we're like, Make it for every man, but but we're not every man. We're a patient in your chair under your medical care. And I think what you mentioned that resonates with me so heavily that I can't even tell you how much it impacts me. I think about it every day is when you sell people things they don't need and you don't say no, it's like equivalent of being a doctor, giving them tests that they don't need, like poking and prodding on a patient for no reason at all, except for to, to bill and make money on testing, which we know you go to jail, you lose your license. It's a huge thing. At least in Texas it is if you do that. Unnecessary testing is a big thing here. So if you wouldn't do it in that instance, why would you do it in a medical spa where it's like, this thing is not going to fix a problem. It's not going to help you. And I can go ahead and make you suffer and do your lips and they can puff up and the whole thing, but it isn't going to get you to your goal, which is, you know, if you're a patient in the chair and medically, it's, you know, health. Here it is, hopefully beauty or rejuvenation, whatever the goal is. But if it's not purposeful, then don't do it. I mean, in your medical opinion, that you would never do that in a real, like, you know, quote unquote, real discipline of medicine. Why do it here? I just think it's such a... 
we lose sight of what we're we all say it all the time, right? It's a medical specialty, but then we don't act like that inside the practice and it makes it crazy. You can't say one and then do the other. You gotta talk out of both sides of your mouth the same exact words and not you know, this like back and forth is killing me. I can't keep up. I can't keep up with it today if we're patients, if we're clin- if we're clients, if we're doing it, we're not doing it. I'm like, it's a lot to take in. It's exhausting for me to watch from the sidelines, <laughs> to be honest. Well, we're in this gray area, right? Like we are, we we're working on beauty, but it's we're working on beauty medically. We are medically enhancing your beauty. It's not, it's, there's no hair, makeup, semi-permanent tattooing. It's, it it is a completely different world. It's, and I always make this comparison because when I would get those, um, what if I get two syringes? Do I get one free? Or what if I do this? Do I get one? Like, is there a discount for this? And And I would be like, listen, do you go to your cardiologist and say, give me two stents for the price of one? No, that's not how it works. You need two cents, you got to pay for two cents, like it's, or your insurance pays, whatever. It's, it's not, a, it's, there's no bargaining, but we created that culture and then it became the beauticians. And then you got these cosmetologues from Russia who like will come here unlicensed on like, I don't want to say uneducated, they could be doctors in their country, but bringing in products from wherever and then injecting into people's faces. And then every week I'm over here doing corrections where I don't, I don't want to be the dissolve clinic. I don't, I don't want to be the correction clinic. I don't like, that's, that's, I don't like doing that. I hate dissolving. Like I I hate dissolving because it's like a medical procedure kind of thing with a really ugly ending. (laughs) You're not, you're not going to be pretty after dissolving, whether you're dissolving your under eyes, whether you're dissolving your lips, like you're that tissue has just gone through so much trauma. I like to put lidocaine in my head like so that people don't like die. So <laughs> then they're super swollen. Then the swelling goes down. Then the tissue is compromised. Then there's bruising. Then there's this. Then there's that. Like it's a really ugly and not fun procedure. But because we have had all of these untrained um, non-US professionals doing things left and right cavalier. One of my patients got her nose done in a car. It, like she did nose filler in the car from this injector from Russia, who is very well known over there. Um, she is a doctor, but didn't have any Hylinex. Um, and just obviously nothing happened to the patient. But when she told me, I was just like, what, what do you mean? If you went blind right now, what would you do? But that's the thing. That's their safety net. You're not going to, they're not going to be able to do shit because what are you going to do? Press, press charges for what? You can't, you can't press charges for anything. There's no license to go after. There's no clinic to go after you there. There was no consent form signed. You just did it. You sat in her car and you got your nose done. Right. Like, and then my DIYers, oh my God, (laughs) the DIYers are, it's absolutely insane to me. I had a, I had a correction that I did. I don't know how, how they blocked three major arteries um, by doing, uh, chin filler. I was like, you must be either super, super lucky and you should go to a casino and play right now because y'all blocked three blood supplying artery, her tissues, her, her lips were dying. Like it was black and her lips were falling off from chin filler. So they got like facial arteries, submental, inferior labial, like all three of that was blocked. So I sat there and I flooded and I flooded and I flooded. And then she called her family member after we did the procedure and the the daughter had the audacity to ask me if i used lidocaine cuz the the per, the patient was complaining uh of the pain and she's like she did tw- there was like 70 needles that i had used cuz i put them in small bd syringes so that they don't again pain control is a very big aspect of what i do um and i put them in those small, small little baby syringes so that they wouldn't feel the pain she wouldn't feel the pain of the constant hyalinex burning through her system and she called her daughter and her said that oh my god i got 77 syringes yada 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 daughter's first response is did she give you lidocaine who are you <laughs> like why why do you think that that's even why did you ask that like you just ruined your mom's face by injecting in the home, ordering product online, watching three videos, and then injecting your mom. And you're asking me after saving her freaking life, uh, did I use lidocaine? But that's why they're doing it themselves anyway. Like that's, I have to wonder about that. How do we help pe- people, the general population, understand 
for one thing, then if it's not, if it doesn't look like a duck, like a duck, it's probably not a duck. Like, why would you go to someone's car to get an injection? Like, holy crap, that's insane. Like, if it doesn't look like a med spa, it doesn't look like a medical practice with, like, you know, a front door and name on the door and, like, you know, a website and, and things that you need to be, like, a legitimate business. If it doesn't look like that, chances are you probably shouldn't go get a procedure done there. Like, you wouldn't go get, you know, a knee replacement in someone's, like, van driving down the road. Why would you do this? Like, I can't I can't ever understand how we teach people and the population, you know, out at large, which sometimes is suspect, what to expect from people, like how to like think critically about stuff. And I think as injectors, you guys have such a burden on you to really explain that. I see it a lot more now on Instagram about how do you know if it's a legitimate injector, legitimate product, what should you ask about for products? I think patients should be asking some things. I think, you know, I think we do have an onus as a patient to ask. And I know that probably offends people, but we also can be taken advantage of very easily, like to what you just mentioned. We don't often know, you know, if you're not a person who kind of knows the industry, you have no idea if they're legitimate or not. You need to ask some questions. And I think it's kind of like we have to work together to say, you got to ask, make sure that I know what I'm, you know, what I'm getting myself into and that, you know, the, the whole no thing. But also me saying, are you who you say you are? And do you have product that's actually legit? Do you have things on site in case I have an occlusion? It's like a, we got to kind of work together. And I think that we've missed somehow along the way teaching patients what they should expect and what to consider to be safe and effective. And it really isn't, I mean, it's not really our burden to bear. I get that. But I think at some point it kind of is, because if not, they keep coming to you. Like if they don't learn what not to do, they're going to keep coming up to your front door, knocking on it, saying, please save my lips, they're dying. And you have to deal with all the aftermath of that. And I think, it, you know, to your point about training your competition or training people who leave, one bad injector in a community hurts everyone because you all have to clean up their mess every day. The reputation that injectables are not safe becomes, you know, this big billboard that starts calling everyone in. And it just creates headaches for you as a, you know, licensed, great injector to deal with things that you have no part of. Yeah, but then you'll you'll have, um, you know, your plastic surgeons doing a green screen on this absolute worst case scenario and creating fear mongering about like how shitty lip fillers or fillers are and how bad they are for you. Like there was that whole cancer article that came out when if you freaking read the article, you would know that there is no link. But that was another thing that people took and blasted it all over social. It's a scary space. Like I understand it's a very scary space. How do you know? How do you know I'm not bullshitting you? You know, like the, the, there's I understand. I, I get where they're coming from, but do it thinking that you can do no other field, no other field. Will you go and think that you can do yourself in medicine? Like you're not, you're not going to go and do open heart surgery at home in the kitchen. You're not going to do any other procedure in at home in the kitchen, except people think they're going to do toxins and in, uh, injections in the kitchen. Why? Wh where did that come from? Well, I think it's also sexier on Instagram to be like, our practice is safe and we do all these precautions. And I know why they're doing it, right? They're trying to, to show their community that they are a safe and effective injector, that you know they have all their stuff together. Like I get that and I applaud that as a as a thing to go out there and say. But they do it by explaining, some do, that not everyone is that way. And so the immediate defense is only we are safe and effective. Everyone else in the community is not. And I think it paints a bad picture for the industry because in many cases, everyone in the community is safe and effective. Like they're all great. It's the idiot who's not on Instagram who no one knows about that's doing all the crazy stuff. Everyone that has a business that's legitimate is doing the right thing. They're going to trainings. They're doing cadaver labs. They have hot on days on site. And I think because it's such a polarizing topic, they post all the like fear monger things, like all the horrible experiences of like everyone else gets these occlusions, but we don't hear like bullshit. You'll get them too. It's just a law of averages. It's can you prepare for your, you know, for the day that it comes. But second of all, you're not the only one doing good things. Everyone's trying to do good things, you know, in many cases. And it's created to your point, this like this disruption of everything is like near death experiences. Like at the end of the day, an occlusion is actually very rare. You're, you're going to have a drop brown where you're going to have anything. And you're going to have bad toxin where you're going to have an occlusion, like just for sure, just law of averages. But it, they're like staking their claim of their Instagram influencer status on fear mongering and saying that they're the only safe person who's ever lived ever in the industry because they went to a cadaver lab once. It's like, that's just not real. Like, it's not helping anyone to say that. It's not helping any of your fellow industry injectors, colleagues who you know are also amazing to put that out there. So I think there is a delicate balance of celebrate how great you are and the things that you did that are really well, but without saying that you're the only one who's ever been safe in the whole history of, of aesthetic medicine. That is my TED talk. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it makes me freaking crazy every day I see it. I'm like, you're not the only person that ever went to a cadaver lab. Shut up. But they think that they, they advertise it that way. 
I talk about this all the time. I, I'm like, I'm talking about non-injector things that will, or injection things or results or this or that all the time to the point where my sister will text me and be like, Noon, just shut the hell up and stick to injecting. Like, why are you, why are you causing problems? Why are you disrupting or whatever? And I'm like, I'm not doing anything to cause problems because I need to do this to warn people, to educate people so that first of all, it gives both of us peace. Because if you have a certain thing in mind and you come in and I can't give you that thing, then you're, then you're like on me of like, you wasted my time kind of thing, or you wasted my money or this or that. Like we need to talk about these things because at the end of the day, this injector from her car doesn't get reprimanded for anything, but God forbid you get heavy in your forehead from talks after I warn you that you have very heavy lids. And if you freeze your forehead, you're going to get even heavier Then I get the, oh my gosh, it's so heavy. It's too much. It's, it's that I do get that. I am going to sit there for two weeks handholding so that the talks can settle and it can relax and it won't be as heavy kind of thing. Like what, why am I constantly speaking on this is because I want people to be prepared for that. Like you don't hold the people who are doing this stuff illegally accountable. Why, 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 when I'm explaining and giving you all of your options, educating, taking time out of my day with the consultation, posting about this, why, why are you comfortable coming at me when there's absolutely nothing wrong, <laughs> but you're okay with someone freaking making you blind? Like it, how, how does that work? That's why I won't shut the F up <laughs> and I will continue talking about this. <laughs> it's because I got a discount. I think when people don't pay full price, they expect crappy things when the crappy things happen. They're like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, I think they're, you know, one of two things, either they get a discount, so they nag the crap out of you. It's always the ones who paid you the least who drive you bonkers, right? Like, even here, if I give a discount to someone, it's like, oh, they become instantly like a problem for you because that's, it's like, they think, I don't know, that the rules bend. I don't know. I don't know why. Or in your case, the person who does the nose in the car, it's like, yeah, you know, but I also paid half of what you to charge me. And like, I kind of knew going in, that wasn't probably a good idea. So, you know. It's like, again, karma. I kind of got what I paid for, and I should have expected it wouldn't be a great thing because she was sitting in her car doing nose filler. Where they come to you, and they're like, listen, this practice has an expert who's injecting. It's buttoned up. It's a nice environment. It feels like it's, you know, posh and, and um, safe and clean and all the things that I'd want in my provider. So it should be perfect because it looks perfect. So it should be perfect. And if it's not, I'm going to come to her and say, you said, or, you know, you should be giving me these perfect results. I think that they'll beat you up because you're, you project that you have your, your stuff together and it's easier to beat you up because they look at you and say, this should be great because you're great. Why was it not great? Not knowing that it takes two weeks, you know, all the things that we say, but I do feel like when you get a crappy result from a crappy injector in a crappy environment, like a car, you kind of expect it and you kind of, you kind of get, you got your own punishment. Like you, you felt, uh, you effed around and found out as they would say. And so I think that's why they come for you whenever it's small things, because they just expect greatness because you project that in the room and you make them feel confident in your ability. And it's like, but I'm let down now, you know, I'm always a person, I'm like the one in a million that gets a bad result is me. So I'm always like, man, well. I don't ever come back and call you because it's like, it is what it is. But some folks say they're just, they never go away. They just always call and text and complain. <laughs> but I think, I think a lot of, I've gotten made fun of for being like the anti-filler filler dealer kind of thing because um, I haven't had a single drop of filler in my face until last year, August 10th. Um, yeah. I had uh, my lips done for the first time after like what, eight years of being in the industry. <laughs> So um, I would always get like, well, why aren't your lips done? Well, why aren't your cheeks done? Or why isn't this done? Why isn't that done? And I would have to have this conversation of, I love how I look. Is that a crime? So it's like, I, I had to so work so hard to be like, the reason why I say no to you, the reason why I'm always talking about this stuff and I'm taking so much time out of my uh, appointment to do your consultation is because if I don't think you need something, you're not going to get it. And the same goes applies to me. If I didn't think that I needed something, then I'm not going to put it in my face. Like I was completely satisfied with the way 
I looked my, I thought, so before all of this injectable and everything world came into uh, the, the, you know, the ideal Instagram face, like I've had this face since I was 16, like <laughs> got the big ass eyebrows, the high cheeks, the pointy ass chin. The other day, somebody on TikTok was like, I think you have chin dysmorphia. And I was like, wow. I mean, I was born this way, but thank you. Like, what, what does that even mean? But this is like, this is how these proportions are what like now people are trying to get right. That this is our golden standard of beauty and yes you can thank the kardashians for that so but so having this space and then aging without adding fillers without doing much else it was like well why don't you look like that anymore and it's like the the things you guys are now trying to achieve like i had when i was younger and right now i don't feel like i need more because we have this thing of like why do these 20 year olds look like they're 40 and these 40 year olds look like they're 20 the answer is Botox and fillers for both. Like the, for both. Why are the 20 year olds looking older? Botox and fillers. Why are the 40 year olds looking younger? Botox and fillers. So there's like a certain time and certain, um, I don't want to say age, because if you're, if you got like a crack in your forehead at the age of 21, it's time for Botox. Like it doesn't matter that you're 21 or 41, but if you've been flawless until you're like, you hit your forties and now you're starting to show the signs of aging, then that's when you start. But that was me like that. That's how I was like when I would go to these conferences and I wasn't talks and I wasn't filled and I wasn't like anything. It was like, why is your forehead moving? And it's like, why wouldn't it move? Like, I'm okay with it moving. What's wrong with that? So when I get the people in my chair, that my main thing is you are beautiful the way you are. And if you don't accept that, you're going to have problems. So all I'm doing is enhancing, working on what you got, working on what you brought me. I cannot change you. I cannot change your face and I cannot change your insides and how you feel about yourself. And getting lip filler is not going to change that either. So then we can move forward. <laughs> but it's so true. But yes, shout out to the Kardashians because the Armenian standard of beauty is now like the thing we all want, right? We all want to look like you, which is shocking that you hadn't had filler. I mean, I, that just shocks me that your face looks like this naturally. I hate you, by the way. I, I did um, have a facelift. So you could have one or you did have one? I did in November. I know I, I, I did see that. You went right you went right for the for the knife. I would like to have one now at forty one, but we're not quite there yet. I might stave it off for a few more years. But what prompted you to do to do that, to do some lifting as opposed to doing some injectables? Because I think you definitely picked the right choice, by the way, but tell us why. This is the conversation that I have in the rooms where people judge me for being 35 and having surgical work done. It's because if I am in this industry, this is what I do day in and day out. Every single day I teach on this. I teach on talks and fillers and all of the things that we can do non-surgical setting. Why the hell do you think I didn't do that? And I went under the knife because that is what I needed with skin laxity at that level, like going from 300 pounds multiple times in my life. Let me put that out there. I didn't just do that one time. I went from morbid obese to anorexic to like, there is no in between for me. I am an all or nothing girly. <laughs> uh, so having that fluctuation, one of the worst things you can actually do for your face is that constant weight gain, weight loss, even if it's like five to 10 pounds a year, even if it's like, e even if it's not at the hundreds of pounds, which is what I was, I was in the hundreds of pounds kind of fluctuation. So that took a toll on my skin, like severely. It wasn't, things were sagging when they shouldn't have been sagging. Like my neck was just straight down. I have this jawline, always had this jawline. I could take pictures and you would think that I have like this angle could cut you. Like, because I knew my angles. However, I'm turning my head and all I'm seeing is just this structure hanging straight down. Our toxins, fillers, injectables, radio frequency, laser treatments, are any of that going to work? No, not for what I needed. I did all of it. Don't get me wrong. I did all the laser treatments. I treated what I could, but I'm, I did all of that for millimeters of changes and to like respect the tissue integrity of my skin. But that's not what I needed. I needed surgical intervention. So I think I'm a great example for that too. I think that gives me that added bonus of I can speak on this because if I could help myself, then I obviously wouldn't have needed to go under the knife, right? Like I'm, I live, eat, breathe, teach this industry. So why wouldn't I put all of that product in my face? Because I know better. And I use that during that consultation process of 
you you pull your, you come into my chair, you do this. I won't touch you. Like anytime somebody's like, I just want this. I'll be like, here's my surgeon. He's amazing. Love him. Shout out Jalalabadi. <laughs> um, but that's it. Like that's, that's don't even waste a dollar with me. Send me your friends. <laughs> Yeah, if you're, if you're picking up your face, you know, with your two two hands, pulling it back, all the things like lifting, as Subio says, you can't lift with sugar jelly. You mentioned that earlier. It just uh, doesn't work that way. And even threads, I think, you know, there are some marginal benefits of threads, but long term, if you needed this done to what you wanted to have done, you want a significant improvement for, you know, the foreseeable future, you got to go under the knife. It just it is, it is what it is. And I think because you were so young doing it, it also helps patients understand that age is not the factor here, that age is actually quite unrelated, you know, to what you need. If it's skin laxity at, at 21 or at 51, it could be the exact same amount of laxity. It just depends on however you've aged. It's also unique to us as people. And I think what you said about being 40 and versus 20, I just re- watched a meme on Instagram about this like two or three days ago about the guy saying like, what was in the water when all of us were born? Millennials, he's like, how do they all look 25 and they're all like 40? And he was just talking about the fact that we all still look really young where our mm-hmm. colleagues and counterparts who are 20, you know, 20, 22, look old because they've gotten too much tear trough filler already. They've already had their cheeks are too big. They they've kind of just you know disfigured their face a bit because they've taken all the like the childlike fat that you want that makes you look young and, and full and healthy and they've replaced it with like these weird filler angles everywhere. So yes, I agree. I think you know some of us are aging. I look better today than I looked when I was twenty five, without a doubt, hundred percent hands down. I like my face way more now than when I was younger. And I think, you know, it's a work in progress as I'm sure you feel the same about yours. Always work in progress. But we just we just know now. We just have learned so much more than we knew ten years ago of what not to do. That we're starting to all look a little bit less um, monster and maleficent like now, thankfully. Mm-hmm. But some of our injector friends need to also take a note and maybe look at some of their their um, cheekbones and and jaws and chins as well. But we'll get there. It's a different that's a different TED talk, a different <laughs> podcast. But as we wrap up here, I want to I want to hit one more thing as we wrap up. You just opened your second location, like I think a week or two ago. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. So now yeah. we're also an, an entrepreneur who's now scaling. So we're, we're an influencer. We are an injector. And now we're an entrepreneur who is deciding to grow their business by, you know, exponential times two here. How does that feel? And what, what was your decision making process to decide to open number two? I was stagnant in my uh, old location. Like I, I feel like I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't grow any more than I could. It was only three rooms. We had a skin room and then we had two injection rooms. Um, and I love that place. I like, I obviously we still go there and we have the clientele who absolutely love that place. But I spent like six years hearing people talking mad shit about that location saying like, oh my God, it's so ghetto. And then it's so hard to find. It's so this, it's so that blah, 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 blah. But they keep coming back, mind you. But at the same time, like we heard all of it. We heard everything. I mean, I've had somebody say like, oh my God, this place is so dangerous. And that's saying a lot because I'm coming from Compton and and like, I, I, I don't even know what to say. So like, we've been here in this building for ni- over, t- what, 19, 20 years because my dad's next door at the primary care clinic. So we've been there for a really long time. We haven't had a single dangerous incident happen over there. Um, but we had people coming in and saying, oh, my God, this place. Is- Why are you here? Why are you here? Your Instagram is all bougie and it looks so nice. And this is just this is, I'm telling you this verbatim. She was like, this is fake. What you're presenting is fake because this isn't the real uh, Stepanian clinic on Instagram. So uh, like having that in my mind and just like getting more and more people in the door and just growing like at a pace that I can't, I couldn't like keep up with in that area. Location two was in the works. Like it was in the, it's been in the works since 2020, to be honest. And I know a lot of people are like, COVID really hurt us. COVID did this, COVID did that. COVID blew me the F up. Like, but I think because I was able to show everything online, like I was able, it wasn't that I was making so much money because people were coming in. I was shut down for three months. Um, it was because during that three months, I got to post, I got to learn, everybody was doing free education live. So there was a lot. To, and I used those three months to like blow up. And we, and that's how it just grew. And then from 2020, I've been looking for a second location, finally secured it. We're in Encino, like it's the border of Sherman Oaks and Encino. So if you say Sherman Oaks, you're right. If you say Encino, you're also right. So it's like we're on that street. That's Sherman Oaks and Encino. Um, it's this big, beautiful space. I'm also implementing the academy through there. I have a lot of stuff in the works for the mentorship programs. I'm working with the university um, to get 
Uh, oh, I don't think I can say this anyway, but <laughs> there's a lot of things that's going to help us in this industry that people are not doing. Um, so I'm really, really proud of that. What do I feel? I feel like an imposter <laughs> even today when I was coming in for the setup with the mic and everything. I'm like, am I ever going to get used to this shit? Like, I can't get used to it. It's been like a year of talks and conferences and stage and podcasts and whatever. And it's still like every single time I get the nervous shits, like it, it's, it doesn't end. <laughs> well, you tell me you're a hotshot big baller. It doesn't get better. <laughs> You know, um, I'm not a hot shot big baller, but th thank you for noticing. No, it, it gets, I think it's, I don't know imposter syndrome. It doesn't, nothing in my mind ever has told me that that's a real thing. Because here's how, I, here's what, what I think about that. For those of you who are curious, that's why I think it's not a real thing. If you work your butt off every day and you are doing the right things and you are staying up late, getting up early, putting in the hours, killing yourself to be better, to help your team get better, like you're doing all the things you got to do then by God, you've earned it. You're not an imposter. You have freaking earned it. Like you have earned your place at the table, your seat at the table for your thoughts to be heard. And like, if I'm on a podcast, it's because someone's one thinks I have enough information to share that's important and relevant that I should be able to share it. Like I just, I never have understood imposter syndrome. It's like, I, I work for this. I busted my ass every day, all day. I sleep three hours a day. Like I've done all the things. This is my moment, dang it. I'm taking it. I'm taking my time because I've earned it and put in all the work to do it. And so if you ever have imposter syndrome, don't have it. If you've worked, you know, you're not an imposter. Like you are, you are the proud, rightful owner of that moment in the sun and go take advantage of it and go bask in the glory. That's what I think. We got all these songs. It's like started from the bottom. Now we're here. Like <laughs> that's, that's literally me. Like we, I just think about like my family and the way I was raised and where we were and what we've become and just, and then also me taking on that legacy and moving forward and how, like our whole lives have changed. That's, I think that's, that's where it's coming from. It's stemming from like, you grew up in a one bedroom apartment with seven people in it. Like that's now look at you kind of thing where it, it's, it's, it's such a big shift where you're like, am I really supposed to be here? Like I'm gonna drop the ball that the shoe's going to drop, like what's happening. But, um, I do have amazing people in my life. Like my parents are very involved. My family is like, they're my number one support. They will not let me fail. Failure is not an option. <laughs> That's just my mentality. But I, with them by my side, there's no way I can do anything that's going to make me fall. Cause all they do is just lift. Like, that's just how, that's how I was raised. Just lift, lift up your kids, <laughs> be there for them for everything. So I, I have that backing. So I don't feel like I'm going to fall, but it's just in the back of my mind, it's always like, wow, how'd we get here? <laughs> Goddamn. <laughs> Can I take a breath? <laughs> well, a few college degrees, a lot of, um, I'm sure sleepless nights, a lot of hard work of learning and training and growing and building. That's how you got here. And you, and I, and I do think you have arrived, my friend. I think the, this is your moment. Um, I mean, really, I mentioned at the beginning, but I've seen you kind of everywhere lately. You've been doing all kinds of talks and you've been working with other companies and, you know, you're at conferences and I think your star is starting to to really set or shine, whatever the word is that you want to use. And I think you've also kind of found your niche. Like you found the people who, um, those of us who love a little bit of controversy, I'm one of them. I love looking at your Instagram and you like call folks out and you tell the truth the way it should be told. And I just think that there's a time for that right now. I think we need more truth tellers and less um, BSers out there who are, you know, they're going to peddle whatever's the, the, the thing of the hour, the hot topic of the hour. I think you say the real thing and you do it well and you're educated and an expert. So I believe what you say. And, you know, maybe this is a new wave of status coming in, a new wave of people who are going to say no and do the right thing and be ethical and propel us forward. That's my hope. Maybe you're leading the charge. This is this is your, um, you know how Snoop Dogg is like carrying the torch for the Olympics? Like this is your torch that you're carrying right here. To be the truth teller of, a, of the aesthetic industry. Love that for me. Yes. So keep doing it. Thank well, you. what's what's coming up next for you? I know um and then I have Dr. Arthur Swift, another uh cadaver course, which I've I've taken so many of those. I've even assisted in teaching one with Dr. Sadat. And I still go to them because every time there's something new that I feel like, oh, I just learned this here in this lab because every, every cadaver we get, there's variations on that. Like not, not a single cadaver has ever been identical to where their arterial flow is. Like, it's just, it's so interesting, but, um, I have that one. And then I have Philly needle art with Dr. Subio. And then I have December, uh, Arizona with Dr. Sadat. Busy with year. Mm -hmm. Busy year, but 
You know, I think the Subio thing, he's such a cool dude. I mean, I know that he has one Instagram personality, but you meet him, you know, live. I've known him for a couple of years now. He's such a cool guy, very fascinating mind, the way it works. And so sweet, by the way, and so humble, which you don't really get from Instagram, but he is actually a very, very nice person. But I think it's like next. But I think it's like next. For one thing that I'll mention is you're doing this whole like injector meetup, which is like a panel of uh, like Q&A, very like real deal, loose seal kind of thing. You know, no pretense, just asking questions and getting real answers. And if you guys have not yet seen that on Instagram, there's like a little QR code to submit your questions, but definitely come to that. I think it's already sold out. It sold out first of all things. I had to put in more seats. We had to bring chairs in. It's already like completely bulging at the seams because everyone wants to hear the truth. They want to hear the real things. And so I think that's a great indication of where we're going as an industry, that they want to come here for people who are doing it well and say, you know, forget all the, the all the BS, the pretense, Instagram. Like what's how do I do these things and be successful? And so, I know you'll be on that one of the days, but definitely come to the talk and stack next if you guys haven't yet bought your tickets. Buy the tickets first of all, and then come here all about industry disruptors and whether that is or is not a real thing. I don't know yet to be. I haven't read her deck yet. Yet to be determined. <laughs> Is from us here at For the Record, that's all I have. I've got a million things I could talk to you about, but I know that our, we've already hit an hour and we'll keep going on and on and on if we don't stop talking. So any last words for our audience? Well, I just want to say thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Tiffany, for inviting me. Uh, another career highlight for me. I absolutely adore you. I think you are one of the best speakers that I have ever had the honor of listening to. Like I fell in love with you at the last (laughs) stage that I saw. Um, And yeah, now I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Well, I've been watching your journey for a long time. So it was so nice at Palladium to actually get to meet you live and hear your story. And I, I thought it was fascinating. I thought the Mean Girl thing, all of it was just fascinating to me of like, you just said, screw you people. I'm going to go. <laughs> you can hold me down, but you're not going to, it's not going to work. I'm going to go for it and I'm going to move and, and move fast and you've done it. So way to say F to the haters. I, I love that journey for you and keep building big things. And guys definitely come see new nay, as I say it right. There you go. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> proud of myself. My country has to say new nay before today, but now I know better. When you know better, do better. If you have a perennial thing coming to, to your town, go see it. They do a great job of putting on educational events, and you'll have great speakers there and go learn and grow. With all that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you. Until next week, guys, we'll see you in the next episode of For the Record. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Record. This podcast is not intended to provide legal or medical advice. It's for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. For more information on this week's guest or to get started with Aesthetic Record, email us at info at aestheticrecord.com. Be sure to tune in next week for more fresh perspectives on disrupting the status quo and surviving in the aesthetics industry.